Secrets of Hawaii's National Parks takes you one-on-one -on -one with the primal forces of nature. Here, we'll follow the red-hot glow of lava as it strikes the sea. Bundle up for a spectacular sunrise above the clouds. Saddle up for a ride into a volcanic valley and stargaze from the top of the world. We'll not only cruise down 10,000 feet to the coast, we'll hit the road for a romantic ride. We'll take a dip into pools of paradise and marvel at the beauty of a black sand beach. In this lush land of astounding contrasts, ancient culture, and ongoing creation, we've got all the secrets. The Hawaiian Islands are home to many of the world's best beaches, most scenic coastal drives, coffee plantations, and quaint towns. But if you want to delve deeper into paradise, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park on the island of Hawaii and Haleakala National Park on the island of Maui offer an experience of a lifetime. In the next hour, we'll discover what makes these national parks two of the most extraordinary places on the planet. We'll begin at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, where each day you'll find the Earth's greatest light show. At dusk, spectators armed with flashlights, water, and a good pair of shoes drive to the point where a lava flow put an end to the chain of craters road. They traverse a rugged terrain of newly formed rock to get a front row center seat to one of the world's most incredible sights, Earth in the making. A force so primal, you simply stare in awe. It's here steam jets blow sky high as liquid lava hits the ocean and cools. And the big island gets even bigger. An estimated 35 acres of new land are added each year. Around any flow, at any hour, day or night, you may meet up with a group of fearless photographers who are so hot on the trail of lava, they call themselves lava junkies. And they're truly obsessed with the sight of it. I think of it as like a living art museum. I mean, if you see something that's really, you think is really great, take a picture of it right away because it it'll be gone in an instant. And you may never see it again. To get the best shot, these guys travel at their own risk across a desolate and at times dangerous land. This is the last little remnant of uh, the chain of craters road. There used to be a scenic viewing area below us where a lot of people came to uh, watch the lava during the, the 90s. So this was the High Castle Overlook and this is the last little uh, touch of humanity that's left here. The lava junkies say there's a secret to finding the best lava flow either after sunset or before dawn is when it's most spectacular and generally if something's happening you won't be disappointed. All this thanks to two giants, Mauna Loa and Kilauea volcanoes. To protect them, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park was founded in 1916. Mauna Loa, with its gentle slope, looks deceptively like a humongous hill. This world's most massive volcano last erupted in 1984. Measured from the ocean floor up to its summit, Mauna Loa is 56,000 feet tall. Standing 20,000 feet high from its base on the ocean floor, the neighboring Kilauea is considered small by Hawaii standards. Small, but mighty. Kilauea has been spewing between 300 and 350,000 cubic meters of lava a day since 1983. So the way to really grasp it is to imagine between uh, 400 and uh, 475,000 dump trucks, each one uh, 10 cubic yards of capacity, carrying the lava away each day. I'd love to have that, that contract, I'll say. Upon seeing the rolling summit of Kilauea, people want to know, where's the volcano? There is no dominant peak. This volcano has a hidden system of plumbing. Magma from hot zones deep within the earth rises beneath the summit of Kilauea. It then moves underground to a spot called Pu'u'o'o. 
From there, lava travels upon surface flows and through tubes a distance of eight miles to empty out into the Pacific Ocean. Kilauea is both an active and accessible volcano, two characteristics that attract tons of tourists. Throughout the course of a day, National Park Service rangers team up with scientists from the U.S. Geological Survey to take the pulse of the volcano. Here in Hawaii, we have a unique situation where we, we are able to go towards the volcano and see the activity up close. Lights on for safety, footwear. So how close can you get? To determine that, you first have to get over a few misconceptions about lava. One misconception is that lava is a river or fountain of fire. Lava is liquid rock with origins far more mysterious than fire. Another misconception is that lava flows are a cause for panic. While they can be dangerous near the point of eruption, when you get onto flatland, lava can move slowly, so you can get as close as the tremendous temperature will permit. Lava flows are kind of self-limiting in the fact that you have a natural instinct in you that will prevent you from uh, getting yourself burned. But most of the times you get close enough, you will feel the heat. The sight of red hot molten lava can stop you in your tracks, but it isn't the only dangerous substance associated with volcanic eruptions. Where there's volcanic activity, there's an emission of gases. Sulfur dioxide and other gases called VOG rise from vents in the earth. At the point where the lava hits the ocean, clouds of steam and hot hydrochloric acid gas are formed. Breathing in these gases can be hazardous to your health. The National Park Service monitors emissions and warns visitors not to enter restricted areas and not to venture out to the benches. These giant sections of hardened lava form quickly extending 100 feet within one to two days. They may look safe, but they're formed over rubble that's constantly undercut by waves. And without warning, benches can tumble right into the sea. The island of Hawaii was formed by lava more than 750,000 years ago, making it the youngest of the state of Hawaii's eight major islands. The continuous volcanic activity also makes Hawaii Volcanoes National Park a magnet for scientists from around the world. The U.S. Geological Survey operates the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, located within the park's boundaries. The observatory was founded in 1912 by Thomas Jagger, an MIT professor who was one of the original proponents of making this volcanic zone a national park. The Jagger Museum pays tribute to Professor Jagger, who was a pioneer in the science of studying volcanoes, known as volcanology. In the early days, Jagger conducted his studies with basic scientific instruments that included a seismometer to measure the Earth's movements. Today, the critical area of seismic monitoring has gone high-tech. There have been vast improvements. The sensors have changed from purely mechanical to electronic uh, sensor. Then also the recording medium has changed from a smoke drum to a computer. The Hawaiian Islands, one of the world's most seismically active spots, are now monitored by a network of 65 seismic stations. The majority of them are concentrated within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Each week on Mauna Loa and Kilauea, hundreds of small earthquakes occur. Monitoring them is one way to determine when the next eruption will take place. The way that this lava flow looked. According to Don Swanson of the USGS, a range of other techniques are used to track volcanoes. Uh, we have a uh, world-class uh, GPS network uh, that allows us to locate ourselves very precisely. That helps us also to monitor the swelling of the volcano by measuring the amount of gas that is given off from the volcano and then figuring out how much lava must, there must have been to have supplied that much gas, we can estimate um, how, much, how much lava is erupting. And then also using a very low frequency um, radio signal, we can measure the cross-sectional area of lava flowing through a lava tube. And then with a radar gun, you can measure the velocity of the lava, and so you can calculate how much lava is flowing through the tube. 
To gather even more data, scientists will take to the skies. Each week, a helicopter carries a field crew to the vent at Pu'u'o'o to retrieve lava samples. This is no job for a novice. Molten lava can reach temperatures of 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. A three-pound weight tethered to a stainless steel cable is sunk into an opening in the roof of a lava tube called a skylight. After a few seconds, the weight is pulled out. Magma sticks to it. It's then dipped in water to quickly cool into glass. This process preserves the chemical composition and texture of the rock that can offer clues of changes in the source deep within the Earth. While great advances have been made over the years, no one can predict the exact date and time of the next volcanic eruption. Every day at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park on the island of Hawaii, the pyrotechnics of Kilauea Volcano lure thousands of visitors. For the native Hawaiians, the volcano has special meaning. Pele is the goddess of the volcano, the source of great power, and she is honored with sacred chants and dances. According to native beliefs, Pele arrived from the Polynesian islands with her followers. She spent a long time wandering throughout the islands, looking for a new home for her family and her fires, until she found an ideal spot on the island of Hawaii and settled at a place called Halima'u Ma'u at the summit of Kilauea. When the first Pele followers came here, which was around the 11th to the 14th century. You had these volcanoes going off. It was like it was major, this island. So this was a perfect home for Pele, for the Pele followers. In the native Hawaiian language, the word Pele means to meander, as both Pele and the lava flows do. But there's more to Pele than major forces of nature. When you speak of Pele, you're actually speaking of thousands of beings who have been dedicated to her spiritually, and that is where her power emanates from. This is why the Hawaiians are so very close to her, is because she embodies all of their ancestors. Pele's power has been felt throughout the park. Her home in Halima'uma'u Crater is the site of numerous violent eruptions of Kilauea. One of the last ones in 1967 filled it with a lake of molten lava that eventually drained away. Today, cracks in the earth continue to release sulfuric gas from that eruption. It's here, at Pele's home, that native Hawaiians pay homage to their goddess through prayers and offerings. This is a very fragile place, and it is the respect that the native Hawaiians give to these entities. They respect the source and the offerings made by them is, is actually for themselves to be constantly aware of where they live. Hawaii's first settlers arrived by dugout canoes. Why they traveled over 2,000 miles across the ocean isn't known. Perhaps it was a war or famine or simply to explore their world. Evidence of their early culture is found along Hawaii Volcano's petroglyph trail. Pu'uloa has the largest concentration of petroglyphs in the state of Hawaii. It's said to be a site of great mana, or spiritual power. Anthropologists believe these 23,000 figures, shapes, and symbols depict cycles of birth and life. Well, here we have an anthropomorphic image, um, a stick figure, in fact, with two legs, short arms and a fairly well-developed head. Um, cupules are in the same area, whether these were done simultaneously with the stick figure or before or after, we don't know. Each cupule or indentation is thought to represent a child. Well, here we have one such image with the cupule as well as the ring around it, depicting a firstborn child. The umbilical cord will be placed in the center of that cupule a rock will be placed over it, and that will ensure the child's longevity 
and health. Again, uh, taking mana from the area. Descendants of the ancient Hawaiians settled outside the park in the seaside town of Kalapana on the south flank of Kilauea. But living in the shadow of a volcano eventually took its toll. In 1983, Kilauea began erupting. Lava poured out of several vents near the eastern border of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And for years afterward, the lava just kept coming. By 1990, a slow but steady flow inched outside the park toward the town of Kalapana. Harry Kim, mayor of Hawaii County, was the director of civil defense in 1990. And it was just a matter of time, you know, when uh, this was going to break and flow towards uh, where people were. And on April Fool's Day, 1990, I, I knew it was uh, within that time. We called meetings and got all of the agencies together to say what our task would be. Maluhia Kuahivi Nui was 11 years old at the time. And all the kids are riding bikes and skateboards, and we're just cruising, going right next to the lava and going around because they had barricades and the lava just kept moving. Finally, the people of Kalapana were told to evacuate the area. And you see them all in flame. People there crying that own this home. And uh, it's sad, it's sad. The house of Robert Kelii Ho'umalu was in the direct line of the lava, but Robert and his family refused to leave. The lava came and stopped at my driveway. He reversed out to the road and went to the ocean and all the way down and took one, two, three homes down the road. So I said it was a miracle. Robert's house was miraculously spared, but the flow kept coming. This time, it threatened to strike at the heart of Kalapana, the star of the sea-painted church, a wood-framed Catholic church the community built by hand. The people just couldn't stand by and watch. They had to do something. With the lava heading straight toward it, the church was hoisted onto a truck and transported to safer ground just in the nick of time. Less than 45 minutes after the move, out of there, the lava closed the road behind them. And that's how stressful it was. And you saw an energy to save the church. And that church was moved. And we, you see it today. The church was saved. But the idyllic town of Kalapana and a way of life was gone forever. I think Kalapana literally is a gift from the highest power on earth. There, there was a warmth there that I cannot express. If you meet any of the old time Hawaiians, you will know what I'm trying to say here. It was just a beautiful place. The eruption of Kilauea that began in 1983 was the Big Island's most devastating volcanic event of the past century. Its continuous spew into the 21st century is all a part of life on an island ruled by a goddess with a volcano at her command. Yet in this seismically active place, the volcano isn't the only destructive force. We have volcanic eruptions, we have earthquakes, and we have tsunamis. Tsunamis are by far the most deadly of all those natural disasters because they've killed more people than all the others combined. A killer wave known as a tsunami is not a tidal wave. In fact, it has nothing to do with the tides. Enormous underwater disturbances caused by earthquakes and volcanoes can push water out in a powerful ripple effect, more like a giant flood of destructive waves. Located 30 miles from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, the town of Hilo sat in the devastating path of three major tsunamis. And as a result, this once populated port is now a series of oceanfront parks with a memorial to the lives lost. The mission of the local Tsunami Museum is to preserve the past and educate the public in hopes of avoiding another tragedy. The Hawaiian Islands are now linked to a Pacific Tsunami Warning System. Although nothing can warn the Big Island against locally generated tsunamis like the one in 1975, this tsunami was generated by an earthquake in Volcanoes National Park. 
right over the epicenter of this quake was a beautiful camping site called Halape. And there were 30 some campers who were there that weekend. And so you have to just imagine at five o'clock in the morning, they're in their tents and a 7.2 earthquake occurs. And in five minutes, they had a 25 foot wave come in and wash over them. The early morning tsunami claimed the lives of two people. Yet a tsunami has another frightening characteristic. Even in broad daylight, it's difficult to see it coming. It could be a perfect, calm day at the beach. And the only indication you have is that all of a sudden the water may start to withdraw, or it may just start to come in. And that's your very first sign that a tsunami is actually underway. The Tsunami Museum advises that if you're ever near a beach when you feel the shake of an earthquake, head for high ground. At Hawaii Volcanoes National Park on the island of Hawaii, the only constant is change. Lava flows obliterate everything in their path. Out of the devastation comes new life. And you never know when things will erupt again. In most places, you don't see geologic change in your lifetime. This is one of the few places on Earth where you can actually watch the landscape change before your very eyes. This cauldron of creation has enticed visitors for centuries. But if you want to spend the night on the rim of a crater, the only place to stay in the park is aptly named the Volcano House. Volcano House first opened as a grass shack on the rim of an active lava flow in 1846. As more and more travelers ventured out to see the volcano, a more upscale building was built, and the hotel continued to evolve. Complete with rooms with a view of the crater, and a former owner named Uncle George, who is rumored to haunt Volcano House. If that sends chills up your spine, maybe you'd be more comfortable near the fire. But this is no ordinary fire. It's been burning nonstop since 1877, earning Volcano House a reference in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Watching over the whole scene is none other than Pele, the goddess of volcanoes herself. Along the two main roads in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, the Crater Rim Drive and the Chain of Craters Road, evidence of an explosive past makes for some unusual sightseeing. Visitors can walk through fields of steam shooting up from cracks within the earth called steam vents. The steam is created when rain seeps below ground and hits the hot volcanic rock. Kilauea is called a drive-in volcano, but bike trips offer visitors a perfect way to move about the park and really see it. There are also plenty of interesting day hikes. On the Kilauea Iki Trail, you can actually cut across the floor of a crater. You may not realize it, but in 1959, this was a molten lake of lava. So molten that waves were rolling in, in the lava, just like water, crashing up against the crater walls. One episode, the lava reached a height of almost 2,000 feet. That's the highest ever recorded in Hawaii. That cinder and spatter then fell down from the fountain and piled up around the vent to create that hill that we call Pu'u Pua'i. This same eruption of Kilauea Iki carved a path appropriately named Devastation Trail. Here, you can see the forces of nature at work. This particular eruption took out the edge of a forest, so one side still thrives, and where there was once total devastation, there are now small signs of rebirth. Around the park, an intricate network of lava tubes are mostly undiscovered, but there's one you can explore. The Thurston lava tube was created by an eruption of Kilauea some 550 years ago. So much of our lava flow travels invisibly unseen through these underground tunnels. And when the eruptions are over, the lava drains out, the caves empty, they cool off. This tube has been a major attraction since it was first explored in 1913 by Lauren Thurston. Lava tubes hold some of the park's best kept secrets. The ancient Hawaiians once used them for their burials, shelter, and storage. They were thought to be totally void of life, 
But in the 1970s, scientists made an amazing discovery. They came into a lava tube like this one. They looked around, they looked in all the little cracks. They found colorless insects, little spiders, even microorganisms, stuff that's so small you'd need a microscope to see it. And these things were special to Hawaii. They don't exist anyplace else. There are actually two parts to the Thurston lava tube, a 400-foot lighted section and the darker side where you'll need a flashlight to move through the pitch black 300 yard part of the tube. And once you emerge from the darkness, just above the spot where a river of molten lava once forged an underground tunnel, you'll find an incredible sight, a tropical forest where oversized hapu'u ferns flourish alongside tropical plants and ohia trees. All this makes Hawaii volcanoes a study in contrasts one of a few places on the planet where within an hour or less, you can experience both a dense rainforest and a barren desert. Yet the desert here isn't your typical desert. The Ka'u Desert gets a remarkable 50 inches of rainfall each year. That's enough to sustain an entire forest. This desert is created by the volcano. Acid rain from the sulfur gases released from vents near Halima'uma'u Crater prevents all but a few rugged plants from springing up. This tropical desert is host to another of the park's secrets. Layers of footprints preserved in the rock prove that people have been walking along the volcano for hundreds of years. Here's the footprint right here. You can see the big toe right there. It's thought the Hawaiians once traveled here in search of lava rock for tools. But these tracks in the hardened ash remain something of a mystery. So it's very unique to see these kind of tracks. I think these are probably one of the, the few places you see tracks in all the United States. Yeah, so that's why we protect these. In spite of the protection, they're slowly being eroded by the wind. One of many forces of nature that shape this land. Other evidence of nature's handiwork can be found in two types of lava rock the smooth mounds called pa hoi hoi, and a loose chunky rock difficult to walk on called a'a. Ah -ah. Both kinds of lava flows came from the same vent, and both were erupted looking the same way. Their distinctively different surfaces come from the way lava travels, on flat ground versus downhill, and from the way lava cools as it moves. Here's something you might not know. This volcanic turf has a space connection. In the 1990s, NASA scientists used Kilauea as the testing ground for a new space vehicle called the Marsicod rover. The tests simulated how the remotely controlled Marsicod might traverse lunar or Martian terrain. Back in the 1960s and 70s, the park first caught the eye of NASA, who sent astronauts here to train because it resembled the surface of the moon. But the dress code for this rehearsal was casual. No spacesuits were required. And once in orbit, the space crew could look out and say aloha to their Big Island training ground. The Big Island's biggest challenge comes from forces beneath the Earth. Just keeping up with the pace of change in the park is a full-time job. The constant flow of the lava causes maps to get outdated and roads to close permanently. And where there's red-hot moving lava, there's the threat of fire. In such a volatile environment, rangers are always on the lookout. Helicopters often take to the skies to prevent even the smallest burns from getting out of control. Fires here are mostly fueled by extremely flammable non-native plants. The park has a policy of zero tolerance when it comes to fire to protect its native Hawaiian species. Just as volcanoes have the power to destroy, they also have the ability to create a place of beauty. A short distance from Hawaii volcanoes, the beach called Punalu'u is one of the island's most exotic secrets. If you're lucky, on this stretch of an all-black sand beach, you might come across a special site resting along the shore. The green sea turtle feeds on algae and seaweed that grows on the lava rocks. 
Here, the black sand is created by the violent interaction of molten lava and the tides. Punalu'u is one of a few black sand beaches on the island of Hawaii, and it's protected by law. In the state of Hawaii, it's a crime to take black sand home with you. Other rules protect Punalu'u's primary attraction. These amazing creatures of the sea are all a part of another day in paradise. Secrets of Hawaii's National Parks travels from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park on the island of Hawaii to Haleakala National Park on the island of Maui. Like the island of Hawaii, Maui owes its existence to volcanic eruptions on the ocean floor. The Haleakala volcano makes up more than half of the island of Maui and is home to Haleakala National Park. The park's borders extend from its highest peak all the way down to the sea. In the Hawaiian language, Haleakala means the house of the sun, and at the summit, Haleakala National Park lives up to its name. So set your alarm clock for the wee hours of the morning, dress for the cold, and scale the volcano by car to catch the sunrise at Haleakala. Visitors make the 10,000-foot ascent above the clouds to an overlook where they'll do almost anything to stay warm. They'll even wear their beds. No matter what time of year, before the sun comes out, temperatures dip an average of 30 degrees from the ocean to the summit. It's a bit chilly for the tropics, but then Hawaii is a land of extremes. Here, you have to wait for the magic moment as the sun makes its way above the horizon. The meaning of Haleakala, the house of the sun, becomes clear. For native Hawaiians, the arrival of the sun is especially meaningful. Hawaiians believe that when the gods created the environment, they gave each part of it spiritual power. The sun has its spiritual power. There is something special that pulls us and gives us strength. By calling out the sun, this is what you are doing. You are asking this power to help you through this day. In spite of the cold and hour of the day, visitors say it's something they'll never forget. It's a magical moment, and it's a chance in a lifetime to, uh, to get up and experience something that few people in the world ever do see. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous up here. Oh, it's beautiful. It's I mean, beautiful. it's paradise. It's romantic. It's amazing. It's beautiful being above the clouds. Yeah, it was stunning. No sunrise is exactly the same, so you're just seeing a piece of artwork. Right before your eyes. From the summit, one turnoff takes you to another awesome sight. Few places on Earth have this combination of rarefied air and rich scenery. And you have a choice of two modes of transportation, on foot or saddle up. One thing you might not expect to find is a cowboy. These cowboys from the Pony Express are your ticket into the heart of Haleakala Crater. The narrow sliding sands trail along the southern edge of Haleakala traverses volcanic cinders and ash that were part of a series of eruptions some 800 to 4,000 years ago. Once you reach the floor, there's time to rest the horses and break for lunch before you giddy up and go again. But if you want to linger for more than a quick bite, you can spend the whole night. The Kapalaoa Cabin is one of three historic cabins that offer you a chance to sleep in a volcanic valley. At an elevation of 7,200 feet along the sliding sands trail, don't expect any luxury. Meals here are up to you. There are bunk beds, but don't count on dropping in. Park reservations are made by lottery up to two months in advance. These secret spots to stay are a favorite among hikers, who know that hiking is the best way to get a close-up view of the wonders of Haleakala. Along the trail, you'll find one of the more vulnerable residents of the park, the Silver Sword. Unique to Haleakala, these majestic plants can live for as long as 50 years, blooming only once before they die. But their biggest threat isn't their life cycle. At one time, 
feral goats and pigs ate nearly all the silver swords, bringing them, along with other native plants, to the brink of extinction. This forced the National Park Service to take some drastic steps. There's a boundary fence all, almost all the way around the summit area of the park, and that's in order to keep out the goats and the pigs um, that have been introduced to Hawaii and that really wreak havoc on the native plants, such as the silver sword. This fence stretches nearly 50 miles along the summit, where sandalwood, pilo, and other native species make Haleakala one truly special place. What you're seeing is similar to the first people who made this trip, who climbed all the way up here and saw all of these native species. These are all Hawaiian plants around us, Hawaiian birds around us. So you guys have signals for the ride today. Unlike the first people to venture up to the summit, today's visitors can challenge themselves to new extremes on the way back down. Bike companies transport riders up to the summit overlook. Okay, so everybody feels good on their bike, right? Bikes for this ride are designed with special brakes, and you'll need them. Once you begin, it's a two-wheeled wild glide, a nearly 10,000-foot descent down the side of the volcano. There are spectacular views, but not much time to take your eye off the road. Several stops help slow down the incredible momentum and let you revel in the moment. Along the way, temperatures rise, so bikers shed their layers of clothing. After passing through the town of Paia, the bikers head toward the finale at the beach, where the surf's up. You can catch a few waves or top off your day with one of Hawaii's most celebrated pastimes. The other side of Haleakala National Park is located on the east tip of Maui. The best way to get there is to take the Hana Highway, one of the most romantic and scenic coastal drives in the world. Hairpin curves hug the Maui coast. Alongside tropical forests, cascading waterfalls, the town of Wailua, and plenty of picturesque places where lava meets the sea, the road eventually winds its way to Kipahulu, an area added to Haleakala National Park in 1969. The park boundaries protect this part of the tropics. In this once isolated land, storms bring as much as 250 inches of rain each year to the canyons in the mid-elevation of the Kipahulu Valley. The water then cascades downhill through at least two dozen freshwater pools. The most popular pools are the lower ones, called the pools of Oheo, lush, serene, and alluring. This is paradise, and it's about as good as it gets. Kipahulu's rich history revolves around the people who first settled this land, dividing an idyllic island into pie-shaped sections called Ahupua'a that stretch to the sea. The Ahupua'a provided each ohana, or extended family, with all the necessities for survival, from fresh water and soil for farming to fish from the ocean. The National Park Service's partnership with the Kipahulu Ohana brings back the past at the Kapahu Farm, a living museum and taro farm within the park that looks more like the Garden of Eden. Taro, a root vegetable, is grown and harvested by hand. Now this, right on the side of these this, this, this taro patches, we have a ditch that goes four corners around the taro patch, and this, this ditch must be open at all times. Taro is planted during a full moon. When mature, it's harvested and cleaned, then cut and prepared for cooking. Thought to have all the vitamins a body needs, taro is the main ingredient in the traditional Hawaiian dish, poi. This is called the haha. This is what we use to eat. This is all edible. And this is the final taro that's cooked. We steam it or boil it, and when it, it, the knife goes through like a potato, then it's fine. But the Kapahu Farm in Haleakala National Park is more than just a look back in time. Kapahu is a very spiritual place. You can go any place in Kipahulu. You have different feeling for different places. And we have people, elders, that live in this in Hana all their life. 
And recently they'd be coming up in and they don't want to leave because they're very touchy. Those who come here to experience native culture come away with a special feeling for a place and the people who bring it to life. At Haleakala National Park on the island of Maui, an ancient volcano serves as a high-tech gateway to the heavens. Right on the border of the park sits one of the world's foremost observatories. 13 telescopes are operated by universities, the U.S. Air Force, and NASA. Nicknamed Science City, the Haleakala Observatory's complex is off limits to the public. Above the clouds, an elevation of 10,023 feet makes Haleakala, the house of the sun, the perfect spot for stargazing. We seek these high spots on which to place observatories to try to get above as much of the Earth's atmosphere as possible. So this is the reason that, that Haleakala was chosen. It's probably one of the five best sites in the world. The modern day explorers are peering into every corner of the universe. It's not only stars they're looking at, it's planets, the moon, and most anything else floating around the cosmos. The University of Hawaii, together with NASA, runs the Lure Observatory, where measuring distances in outer space with lasers bounced off objects like the moon enables scientists to calculate distances from the center of the Earth. The U.S. Air Force and the Department of Defense operate the Maui Space Surveillance System that scans outer space. The Department of Defense has had an observation post on Haleakala since the 1960s. They keep an eye on the orbits of 8,000 satellites as they circle the globe each day. And the Air Force has a powerful new tool. Haleakala is home to the Defense Department's largest telescope. With a diameter of 11 feet, this technical marvel pushes the job of monitoring space light years ahead. It can pinpoint an object the size of a basketball thousands of miles away. The Air Force Observatory operates 24-7. Daylight sensors can follow satellites even when the sun is shining. And they keep a lookout for more than just orbiting satellites. So we actually look for non-man-made objects that might be in a potential collision course with, with uh, the Earth. So definitely we're protecting planet Earth. Outside Science City, a flight around Haleakala Crater offers a perspective you can't see on your own. This bird's eye view shows off one of the park's most colorful secrets. Over time, the exposure of iron, sulfur, and other mineral deposits to the elements of nature creates these brilliant colors. Haleakala is called a dormant volcano, so don't count it out. Though it's not currently erupting, geologists consider Haleakala to be an active volcano. After all, it's been erupting on and off for thousands of years. The youngest lava flow on the island of Maui can be found outside the park at La Perouse Bay. Recent radiocarbon dating of the lava rock suggests the last eruption of Haleakala took place between 1480 and 1600. USGS field geologist David Sherrod says the date of its next eruption is anyone's guess. When? That's kind of the problem of deciding when your teenager is going to clean his or her room. We don't know when this volcano will erupt. It's in a long period of repose right now. It's not going to become active in a week or a month, probably not even a year. But as sure as the sun gets up each morning, we're confident that Haleakala will have an eruption sometime in the next 200 to 500 years. As to a connection between the volcanoes in Hawaii's national parks, Many people think if Haleakala erupts, the Kilauea and Mauna Loa volcanoes will follow. But experts say, no way. There is no volcanic connection, no magmatic connection in the underground. Haleakala is about 160 miles from the hotspot, 200 kilometers. It once was the hotspot volcano. This volcano, however, is completely disjointed from the hotspot. It has no way to talk to Kilauea or Mauna Loa. When they talk, it doesn't listen. Haleakala will erupt again 
because it was once over the hot spot and so much heat is stored at its base. As for new hot zones, back on the island of Hawaii, one site within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park is definitely heating up. First noticed in the 1930s, an area right along the chain of craters road shows the telltale signs of thermal activity. Steam vents, smoldering trees, and dying vegetation. This area has expanded to 37 acres and it may be moving across the road. And even more earth-shaking changes are on the way. The same undersea hotspot that produced this island chain is at it once again. A new island called Loihi may be forming 15 miles off the coast of Hawaii. But don't book a hotel room there just yet. The top of this volcano is still some 3,000 feet below the surface of the Pacific Ocean. Someday, it could add the ninth island to the Hawaiian chain and continue the life cycle that gave birth to this Pacific paradise millions of years ago. Just a constant reminder that Earth is a sea of change that we, we can't, of course, stop or even modify. Visitors from all over the world have answered the call to paradise. But it's not just about beaches and tropical sunsets. Haleakala National Park on Maui and Hawaii Volcanoes National Park on the island of Hawaii are unlike anything in the world. In this land where everything is temporary, you can get a front row seat at the crucible of creation and witness the power of a goddess named Pele, along with an astounding diversity. You can hike across a lunar-like landscape and move from an abyss of crimson rock and sky to the blissful pools of a tropical valley. Hawaii's national parks chronicle the history of the Earth itself. It's here the age-old drama of destruction and creation plays out right before your eyes. Visitors leave these parts not only with picture postcard memories, but with a renewed awe and respect for the powerful forces shaping our planet. <laughs>